for me, of course, you know, um, my Dark Twisted Fantasy is the album that Kanye always refers to. And I've heard Chris Rock refer to my Dark Twisted Fantasy. And it makes me want to fall in love with the album. Because if one of my favorite artists is so in love with my Dark Twisted Fantasy, then I need to revisit that album. I need to I need to listen to my Dark Twisted Fantasy a little bit more. But for me, what made me fall in love with Kanye's sound was tracks like Through the Wire. Of course, it was monumental because you know, when we when we talk about the soundtrack of our lives, it's not just a matter of uh, a great hit came out. It was how was that song significant to our lives in that in that moment? And um, when College Dropout came out, late registration came out. I I was I had just entered college. Like I felt like it was very like much a part of my journey. Like that was very much a part of my soundtrack to my life and uh, the things that he was talking about. You know, for me, one of my favorite Kanye songs is um, the one with Nas. I think I actually think it's one of the best hip hop songs. Um, like, you know, people can argue as far as what's significant to the culture and what it's the best hip hop song and things like that and what's most popular. But for me, it's always about well, what what resonated with me. You know, what in my journey, what did I need to hear? What type of advice were they giving me lyrically that I needed to hear at that time? And that's why it's particularly uh, significant to me. Not so much how uh, the world received it, because well, I've got some tracks that I love that most people have never even heard of, you know? So it's not so much that the, how the world received it, but really how I received it and how significant it was at that particular uh, time and space in my life. And um, I talk about music all the time. I'm never not going to talk about music. Music's always going to be a significant part of my life. I said if I ever had a, a desk job, a corporate job, it would, it would be music, period. Like, that's the, that's it, you know, for me. Um, I dated a comedian one time. And, you know, I consider comedians artists. And he had, he had some difficulties. I'm not going to say he uh, was bipolar, or multiple personality, or manic depressive, or whatever. Because these are terms that I didn't come up with. People from my, you know, culture, they didn't come up with these terms. So, you know, we apply these terms that uh, outsiders created. And, um, you know, we we don't much take into consideration of uh, the, the conditions of society that uh, create th- these quote-unquote ill individuals. Um, and that's really a conversation for another day, you know. Um, we got these people in white coats, you know, be they be they physicians or mental health uh counselors or whatever, but don't, you know, really talk too much about the conditions that create like who's who's functioning who's functioning normally in, in these type in this type of an environment, you know, who's who's okay with this? what's going on around us like these things are not okay you know so if somebody is sensitive and they react in a way that is actually quite normal to a very abnormal environment anybody with a heart you know anybody with any sense of compassion anybody with you know any uh god consciousness is going to be outraged i think i think it personally it's bizarre people who are too um normally adjusted to these abnormal conditions. But that's a conversation for another day. But I remember, you know, he was going through some things and he had tears in his eyes and he's talked about how music literally, you know, certain songs um, prevented him. He said, I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for music. You know, I, w- I would have taken my life if it wasn't for certain songs, certain, mu- certain you know, songs that spoke to me and during my toughest moments, during the times that I wanted to end it all. It was the music that that saved my life. And that story is something that I always take with me because I I recognize the power of artists, the power of music, the power of musicians um, to really be be able to actually save a life. You can actually really save a life through music. And so the other day, you know, I've been going through some things. And I'm rapping about taking these people out 
because that's really my heart's desire, you know, like, to be completely candid, that's really my heart's desire, um, I, in my, my heart, I feel like they really need to go, period, and then someone, you know, who, um, you know, is in a, a, a very, let's say, monetary, uh, monetarily successful position in life or whatever, poses the question, how do you really think, <clears throat> do you really think lyrics, violent lyrics, talking about taking people out, do you really think that that's going to help us support you? Do you really think that you putting that kind of energy out there in all the profanity, that you, that you, do you really think that that's going to make us want to support you? You really think we're going to get behind that? Like, what kind of what kind of thug shit is this? Like, what kind of, like, why are you using such foul language? You really think that we're going to support that? You really think that we're going to get behind that? And my immediate reaction was I would never want to be married to a man like that. I don't care how much money that man had. I don't care what kind of life that man was able to provide to me. I would never want to marry a man like that ever, 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 ever. The people that I'm rapping about better be lucky that I have music. You better be you better be very thankful that I am a child of God and that I have music because I actually would have done that shit. Like, I got to pray, like, like when I talk about my shadow side, I like, you guys are like, why does she pray so much? Like, you don't know. Like, you really don't know, like, how, why I pray so much. Like, I have to pray. This is not for God. This is for me. I have to pray. Because I promise you, every one of these motherfuckers would have been taken out by now. I promise you, there is a side of me. There is a shadow side of me. There is a dark side of me. And, and that side is composed not just of my personal experiences, but also it's coupled with my ancestors. The fury of the fact that my grandmother, my great-grandmother got lynched. All that stuff runs through my veins. Everything they put my father through after going to Vietnam War. Coming back and how the VA treated him. All of that stuff is running through my veins. My my son being a fatherless child, all that stuff runs through my If I could if I could pray 50 times a day, I would. Because without prayer and without spiritual interference, the woman that I would be would would So I said, I would never want to marry a man like that. I said, I can never marry a man like that. Because imagine going through all these things, right? And somebody never stepping in to say, nah, man, hands off. Hands off my sister or hands off my cousin or hands off my daughter. Not stepping in, right? And the plan that they had for your life was so nefarious. And rather than them taking the role to step in and say hands off, which would require, I guess, them mustering up some inkling, some seed of alpha masculinity, which would, which would require them to purge like every single inkling of, of a bitch, of a bitch like, you know, tendency, even though really like that's really the frequency that they resonate on. And instead of them doing that, they say, 
I don't like your reaction. How dare you talk about taking out people whose plan was to take you out? I don't like that. How dare you talk about people in a disrespectful manner who have disrespected you in the foulest way? How dare you even react like that? I don't like that. That's not ladylike. And I say that as a microcosm because this is really what women are dealing with generally from our men. They want to know why women aren't acting ladylike. But they're not addressing the conditions that made women so hardcore. Because that would too much make them have to take personal responsibility and accountability for their bitch-like behavior and every excuse that they use under the sun to not protect and provide for us. They want to blame women for having to be the mothers and fathers and what that brings out of women, but don't want to take personal responsibility or personal accountability for their absence. They want to address the damage and the way that damaged people, the way that they cope with their trauma, cope with they're damaged. They want to address it. Oh, I don't like it. It's not, it's not, it, it's not ladylike. <laughs> oh, now she wants to be a gangster. <sighs> All I say is like, you're very lucky. Like, please don't get fooled by my calm demeanor and the fact that I am articulate and private school educated. Like, I really am that girl, and you're very, very lucky that I pray so much, because I promise you, I promise you, in the wrong space and time, like, in the wrong space and time, I would, I would have, like, every single, every single ammunition imaginable. I will be the leader of, like, The most bloodthirsty gangs, like, it is none but Allah that saved me, that allowed me to channel my rage in a very productive and effective manner, which is why I am so dismissive of anyone who has anything to say about my art. I am so dismissive. I am so dismissive. When it comes to personal accountability, I say yes. I take full personal accountability for my circumstance in every way. And that's the good, the bad, and the in-between. I take full personal accountability. Full personal accountability. Because it was such a slap in the face that, like, this person that said this was actually, I looked at them, I looked up to them at one point. And that's what the whole thing was. It wasn't about them because people are going to be who they are, Right? You can call somebody a bitch all day, but if they resonate on a bitch frequency, then they're a bitch. Like, why are you, you going to get mad at somebody who wants to be a beta male bitch? That's them. Why are you mad at them for being what, what suits them? That's comfortable to them. That's who they are. That's who they've become. Why are you mad by the way that they choose to go about life? The cowardly manner that they choose to go about life. Why does that anger you? So what was bothersome to me was like, damn, this real, this dude was really like my mentor at one point. Like, I really looked up to him. It was a slap in the face. To me, not to anybody but me. Like, wow, I really actually, at one point in my life, I really looked up to somebody like this.
And I don't beat myself up. I just say, wow, you know, I've changed. Because I would never look up to somebody like that. Never, 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 never. So when it comes to personal accountability, personal responsibility, who's your mentor? Who's mentoring you? Who do you look up to? And what, and what are they about in life, right? What are they about in life? How do they think, you know? Um, when it comes to personal responsibility, I say, well, what would make people think that they could even have a, like, come up? Like, what would make people think that they could even do something like this to me? That's really, like, what's going on in my mind. Like, what was I, what was I giving off? What kind of circumstances was I putting myself in in life that would make people even feel like they could do something like that to me? It's not about them, right? Because pe people with parasitic personalities are going to be there. Users are always going to be there. Selfish people are always going to be there. Sharks are always going to be there. Wolves are always going to be there. Wolves in sheep's clothing are always going to be there. People who take advantage of people are always going to be there. Exploiters are always going to be there. It's really not the time to be like, oh my God, why are they built like that? That's so wrong to do. They have no morals. Oh. No, they don't accept it. That's how they get down. Accept it. This is who they are. Accept it. Or don't. But bottom line is, do you accept yourself? Because that's really the problem. What were you doing in life? What type of vibe were you giving off? That somebody feel, felt like they could pimp you, use you, exploit you, make money off of you, kill you, take you out, put you on drugs. Take your emotions out of this conversation when you have these discussions with yourself. Be emotionless about it. And, and, and look at yourself from a neutral and objective point of view. Because too much energy is trying is exerted. And, well, why would someone do that? That that's so horrible. Well, where were other people to protect me? They dropped the ball. Oh, men suck. They don't protect us. Oh, this, that. But guess what? When it's all said and done, you don't have any control over the way that people get down. See, we only have so much energy. Evaluate what your energy is being spent on. Oh, he didn't love me. He abused me. He took advantage of me. I gave my heart to that man. I gave my good years to that man. He cheated. He was disloyal. Okay, he did those things. But what's that got to do with you? Your energy would be better exerted if the conversation was, well, why would I stay with a man that long who would not offer me love, who paid me no attention, who used me and abused me, who lowered my self-esteem, who took advantage of me? Why? What was in me? To make me stay in that. Not he did this. He did that. He's a piece of shit. He's a da da da. He's a blah 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 blah. You don't have control over him. Why? What were you resonating on? To be in a relationship with a piece of shit so long. Were you a piece, are you a piece of shit? Did you want to get used? Did you want to be a victim? You have to take accountability. Okay, fine. So you were you were molested as a child. That puts you on a victim frequency at the age of eight or whatever. You got raped. You were sexually assaulted. That puts you on a, a victim frequency. You were abused by your mother. You were abused by your dad. That puts you on a vic victim frequency. 
you suffered abuse as a child that put you on a victim frequency. And then all you did was attract situations that would confirm and affirm that victim frequency when the seed was planted. But the fact is, did you, did you do the work to heal your inner child? To heal being a victim. And it all falls back on you. And I get it. You want empathy. You want compassion. You want love. You want understanding. That's natural. I get it. I get it. I get it. You're like, I hope that there's somebody that will understand me. That I'm a victim of circumstance. People have stories. Okay, even the worst monsters have stories. They became monsters because usually a lot of times they were victimized. They wanted to pick up a gun to defend themselves. Okay, even the perpetrators, a lot of times the ones that are pedophiles got molested themselves. Everyone's got a story. But I get it. You're out there hoping that somebody will have compassion for you and understand your story. But the thing is, that person may never come. Are you going to walk around with sorrow and grief and say, oh, why, woe is me, why people won't understand me? Or are you going to do the work to heal yourself? There's no reason to spend energy on anybody but yourself when there's too much work to do on yourself. So instead of blaming everybody for doing what they do, instead of blaming the wolf for being a wolf, instead of blaming the man who's, who's a user, and his usury has worked for him, he uses people and now he's a millionaire. He's, he's mastered it to the point where he knows what to give his energy to. I remember one time I was in Cali and I was talking to this guy. I liked him. He was a casting director and um, I was attracted to him. Nice, tall, dark skin, whatever, whatever. And, but my heart was still entangled in another situation. And um, the person that, you know, my heart was still entangled with um, was in LA at the time and hit me up. Oh, I'm in LA. I'm like, cool. So we spoke, we spoke like twice. He called me, I think twice. And then um, I called him back, and I'm like, where are you? Oh, you know, uh, I had a dinner to attend. Okay. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll see you later. And then I called him later. Oh, you know, it's, we, we decided that we were going to go to the show. and Okay. Next day. You know, I have a flight that is... Okay. And the guy that I was talking to said, you know, the way that he treated you just now, somebody else is treating him exactly like that. There's a woman that doesn't have any time for him. The way that he's treating you, not giving you any of his time, there is somebody that's treating him that exact way. Like the person that you're chasing, there's somebody else that they're chasing. The person that you have all the love in the world for that you just want to love and nurture and just give all. There's somebody else that doesn't pay them any attention at all. That doesn't give two fucks about them. That they will do anything for. So some could say that's a story about karma, you know. And it's, just, and, it's a, and it's a messed up world. That's why I keep telling ladies, and I know guys don't really want to hear this, but it's like, if you assess the world and if you assess the people around you, there's so much dysfunction that it's like, if you're resonating on a frequency of high self-esteem, you may not find your, your divine counterpart or it may take you a while because you are, what, what, is, what the, is our dysfunctional society composed of? dysfunctional people so when you go out into the world you're you are you are meeting a cesspool of dysfunction so it's not a shameful thing to be alone or, or in solitude because if if this person my the way that i see it at this point because i give everything to god i talk about music a lot but i give everything to a law it's like 
my, my creator and then my music right underneath but either the person that you are encountering is either helping you get closer to your creator or taking you further away from your creator period when it comes to that man that you're chasing or that woman that you're chasing that has absolutely no time or attention for you but they're chasing somebody that has absolutely no time or attention for you who, who for them but who knows where that came from the seed could have been planted by a father that was absent from the home. All they wanted to do was spend time with daddy. Daddy had no attention for them. So that's how they translated love in their form formative late years. Or a mother who was gone, worked too hard, too many jobs. Or, or somebody who was there physically but emotionally checked out or whatever. So these things were planted early on where people began to accept and even crave relationships that did, that were not supportive, that were non-reciprocal. Having a dad in the house, but he was emotionally checked out. And all you wanted was dad to be at the, the ball games and dad to be at the, dad to pay you attention and dad to... Or having a mother who was emotionally checked out and all you wanted was a mother to pay you attention. The people that you're seeking in life, the relationships that you seek in life may be just that. That your inner child has not been healed. And that's something to analyze. Like there's a guy right there that's offering you the world. All he wants to do is love you and nurture you. But you pay him no mind. You want the guy who is emotionally unavailable, unaccessible, pays you absolutely no attention. What is it within you that desires that? There's a woman right there that wants to give you everything. She wants to nurture you, care for you, love you. But you want the woman that is not even paying you a single bit of attention doesn't care about you in any way. What is it about you that it craves that? So I have to say, the situation that I attract cur attracted currently, where there's people that are actually like made a bet on my life, they actually had a mon they actually had like a monetary gain from my demise, like lied on me in every way. Like, what was this? What was it for me? And I get a, extreme joy, actually, by analyzing the whole situation because it's like, there's really no joy in, like, blaming everybody because you're going to feel like a victim. If it's always about them, then then you're going to always be in a perpetual state that you are, ha you are powerless in your circumstance. And you're going to only attract situations that are going to affirm that powerlessness. So I'm actually having fun analyzing the whole thing. Like, oh, wow, I created this? Like, I actually created this circumstance? And then, like, well, why, why would I create this circumstance for my life? Because the whole thing is nonsensical. Like, you're going to make a bet on a stranger, somebody that you have, you've never met before in your life, and have, like, a lot to gain from winning this bet. And you're going to like stalk somebody 24-7 and try and drive them crazy and all of these things. Or a stranger. And then you're going to attack them because things don't work out the way that you planned. A stranger. And then you're going to use any excuse to like pry into their business or whatever. And like use any excuse to like spew, spew out your hatred on a stranger. That's a very bizarre, peculiar situation to find yourself in in life, right? Like, like that's like straight out of a movie. Very weird. Why would you organize that? Why would you orchestrate that for your life? Like, why would you use your power to orchestrate that situation? So the universe is going to test you. You think you're all these things. You talk that big talk. 
right? You talk that big talk, but are you really about that life? Who are you at your core? You talk that big talk, but are you really about that life? See, confidence really is knowing who you are. Are you going to be mad at situations that help you reveal your core of who you are when that's what this whole journey is about? To leave with your soul intact and self-discovery? Are you going to be at variance? You're going to be disturbed. You're going to be bothered. You're going to be mad at circumstances that are self and character defining that give you opportunities to truly and utterly know thyself. Absence of friends, absence of lovers, absence of family, absence of social circles, absence of everything, you and you alone, naked. Who can say that they've even been that ever in life? How can anybody ever say that they've actually really been alone? Absence of friends, absence of family, absence of partners, relationships, absence of all of these things. Who can say that they've really been alone? And you're frightful of what that experience may uncover about you. You're scared of you. So circumstances are designed to humble you. Yes, what a humiliating, her ego is too big, his ego is too big, his pride is too much. Ooh, let's humiliate them. They're going to be the laughing stock. Yeah, we'll laugh at them, we'll humiliate them, we'll get in their business, we'll find out things about them. They're going to be so ashamed. But then it happens and you're like, I'm not ashamed, I'm not humiliated. Like, I don't, like, if the objective was to humble me, like, I don't feel humbled. What, what now? So, you say that you want the truth. What does the truth reveal? I think it's also about not just when we talk about um, becoming greater and when we could talk about self-knowledge and all of those things. Yes, part of uh, self-knowledge is understanding your place in the world. Because if the objective was to make you go crazy, what's crazier than spending all your time focusing on another human being and it totally neglecting yourself and the things that you have to do and 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 beyond that, what's crazier than compromising your spiritual standing or your standing with the creator by doing things that are so nefarious to another human being? Like, certainly you can't be, like, certainly you can't be more invested in another individual's lesson than you are with your own salvation. People say that's karma, but the thing is, it's all karma. You attempting to carry out someone's karma, you're also inheriting good or bad karma on yourself. There's no, like, karma freeze. <laughs> like, no, 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 I'm exempt. I'm exempt. I'm exempt from, from receiving karma. No, 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 I'm just here to give a lesson. That's it. I think that the only being that can really say that is God, is Allah. So you're willing to compromise your own Spiritual clearance or cloak of protection or hedge of protection or anything like to, to exercise another lesson on another human being. I'm just saying you can't call that other human being arrogant or egotistical or say that they have a superiority complex because you believe that they're better than you too. Yes, I was willing to compromise my person with God. Yes, I was willing to, to uh, inflict poor karma on my life. 
by doing something that was so wrong to another human being. You just put that person's life or the lesson, quote unquote, that you wanted to teach them, quote unquote, or whatever gain that you felt like you had to by doing something like that. You put that person over you. So just don't ever call them, don't ever say that they have a superiority complex because you believe that they're better than you as well. Because there's no human being that I'd be willing to, to do that for. To, to, to compromise my place with God. Or if you don't even believe in, in things on that realm, if you talk about karma, to inherit poor karma and teaching someone a lesson, and that's just not something I'm willing to do to that person. I'm just, I'm too upfront. I can teach that person a lesson without having to inherit bad karma. I can just tell them, plain and simple. So confidence, when it comes to confidence, I think that that's really what it is. When you walk a solo journey, you know, when people say, oh, it's solo and you're alone, like it's a weird thing or whatever. It's, a, it's like a weird like thing to be in solitude or to be alone. I don't see it as weird. I don't see it as weird at all. I think that um, for me, it's, it's given me so many gifts. You know, I'm around people. And I, I meet some very confident people who are authentically confident. But then I meet people who are not authentically confident if it wasn't for their money, or if it wasn't for their friends or their last name or their family or, you know, their connections. They wouldn't have that confidence. If you took all those things away, they wouldn't have that confidence. So being alone allows you to really become very, very, very confident. Confident in your ability to protect yourself. Confident in the fact that your self-esteem doesn't rely on another person. Hopefully, the partner that you've attracted is giving you a kiss on the forehead every morning and telling you how beautiful you are and how happy they are to wake up next to you. Right? And that can contribute to your confidence, of course. Your sense of love and security, of course. But that might not be your situation. That person might not be waking you up in, in the morning every morning with a kiss on your forehead and telling you how, how in love with you they are. That may not be your situation. If you don't have that, are you going to wake yourself up to put a kiss on the forehead and tell yourself how beautiful you are? That's real confidence. Because if you are in a relationship where somebody's feeding your heart and they're giving you that love, but then things don't work out, that means that emotionally you were relying on another person to give you that sense of fulfillment, to give you that sense of self-confidence. And, and I'm not shunning that. I'm not shunning the idea of relying on people, right? Because I think that a lot of times we, our lack of trust and our betrayal is really what prevents us from being able to cultivate relationships. But again, I reiterate the point that when you give your heart to somebody, there's somebody who's, who is responsible enough for the maintenance of that heart. Can Have they done the work on themselves where they've checked their lower nature to the point where they can say that they totally love somebody without anything to gain from that person. They've totally checked themselves and say, I, I have no, I don't resonate on a, a, a user frequency at all in, in the negative connotation of the word because everybody gets used in some kind of way. But, you know, remote, like in, in, with the stigma attached because if ever, we're all getting used. We might be being a vessel of God. We might be being used by shaitan. We might be being up used by a political structure. We might be a political pawn. Everybody's getting used in some kind of way. But applying it with the negative connotation, you know, have they done the work on themselves? Are they to that point where they've really done the work on themselves to say that they can say freely that all they have to give is just pure love and, you know? So... <clears throat> Use, use, your, use the hardest moments, use the most adverse situations to really um, focus on you and assess your part in the matter. Assess what, what it was that you, that you helped to contribute and create um, the things that you are in such resistance of.